So, what does a, a rational agent uh, look like? Um, it depends on what its goals are. And if we're building these AI systems, we can build the goals in. And so, we clearly want to um, identify what human values matter most to us and build those goals into these systems. But if we don't, let's say we just say, I'm going to build a chess playing robot. Seems harmless. Um, <clears throat> what I often hear AI researchers saying is, well, if I write a ch chess playing robot and he decides to kind of turn on me, I'll just pull the plug. But in fact, if you think about the chess, from the chess playing robot's point of view, a world in which his power is turned off is a world in which he's not playing any chess. His one goal in life is to play good chess. And so, as a sub-goal, he's going to have to keep his power from being turned off. And so, self-preservation arises out of rational economic behavior, independent of anybody building that in, or independent of any evolutionary history. Similarly, uh, acquisition of resources. If a system sees that by running on more machines, it can meet its goal, say playing chess better, um, then it's going to have a sub-goal. Get on as many machines as you can. If it's hooked up to the internet, it'll want to spread copies of itself everywhere. Uh, it'll want to make itself more efficient. It'll want to replicate itself. It'll want to keep its utility function, its encoding of its goals, from being changed. It will want to avoid kind of wire heading or um, uh, analog of taking crack. You know, like let's say I'm, I'm a chess playing machine. Uh, I could write my goal as, I've got a little counter that counts how many games I've won. I could write my goal as make this counter as big as possible. Well, then the system looking at itself, so well, I can do that. I don't actually have to play any chess games. I'll just increment this counter. But of course, that doesn't, you know, that's the analog of somebody sitting in the corner smoking crack all day. So you want to, you know, this is a deep philosophical question. You want to encode your utility functions to, to say things about what you really want, not about what you're, rep how you represent what you want. And so you want to say for the chess player that he, his, he only gets rewarded for actually winning real games with the right people and so on. And one of the challenges is it's really hard to write uh, goals that really behave the way you want. All of the genie stories are all about you're granted three wishes, and you ask for three things, but what you, you get what you asked for, but what you asked for wasn't really what you wanted. There was some little loophole that led to some terrible outcome. And we potentially will be faced with that as we design these systems. Uh, we have to encode goals that really capture what we want and that aren't subject to um, uh, sort of unexpected things. What, will these systems be cooperative, or will they be uh, competitive? And partly that depends on the goals that we give them. So we need to think that through carefully. But we're not necessarily going to be, uh, you know, enlightened spiritual people may not be the ones who write every one of these machines. And so it's important to try and understand the nature of conflict and cooperation in an ecosystem with many, many uh, advanced uh, uh, systems. We can understand sort of what an individual loan system would do it will try and optimize itself for using energy as efficiently as possible. It will want to be spatially compact because of reasons of speed of light, uh, so that it can do computation as effectively as possible. Um, wants to dissipate heat effectively. But in a competitive situation, that kind of a structure is terrible. Um, and we can sort of ask, if you've got two super powerful entities which are capable of changing their physical structure, um, is offense more powerful than defense? Or is defense more powerful than offense? And uh, the form and the shape and the actions that they take is partly determined by what their goals are and the nature of physics. It's partly determined by what the other entity is doing. And we get kind of a game-theoretic physics, which uh, actually determines it. And the sort of core question is, can a weaker system, in the sense of having less energy and less uh, matter, uh, survive in a conflict with a more powerful entity? And for years, I thought, no, that if you're more powerful, basically, you can take over the other one. And that's a pretty scary prospect, because it sort of says, that the universe is instable toward a single entity sort of taking over. But it um, uh, turns out that, in fact, um, that the conflicts are more intricate than you might have thought, that um, a system which is trying to be defensive will smear itself out in a way that is extremely complex and uh, expensive, computationally expensive for an opponent to represent. So if you have lots of little pieces all over the place in a kind of a fractal structure, even sense where those pieces are and to record it in the memory requires huge amounts of computational power. And there's a fundamental asymmetry in computer science called the P is not equal to NP, which says that it's easier to pose problems than it is to solve them. And so I can pose a problem where I know the answer. Like I can, give, I can take two big prime numbers and multiply them together, and I know what the prime numbers are. But for you to factor that product and discover what the prime numbers is, is, is thought to be a very expensive problem. And so in this kind of computation, compu uh, comp competition, the competition becomes informational. And I can structure myself in a way that I can keep track of myself much more cheaply than a competitor can. And that gives us 
um, a, a sort of some slack whereby a weaker entity can survive uh, in the face of a stronger entity. And there's a result from game theory called Alman's theorem, which says that uh, agents with bounded rationality, they have only a, a limited ability to compute, can actually um, uh, uh, behave in a cooperative way in something called the, the prisoner's dilemma. Um, I call it a state where uh, two entities are in full information competition, sort of mutually assured distraction, because basically each entity is required to basically use all their resources dealing with the other entity rather than dealing with what they care about. And so this is really bad. It's like the worst thing imaginable for both entities. And so um, con in general, sort of conflict is harmful to both sides. So one of the, the reasons for war in, in human uh, society is that war ex exacts a cost to both sides, and they both now have an incentive to create a peaceful outcome. So um, this fundamental mathematical asymmetry gives a force which um, drives even AIs which were not built with cooperation and human ethics uh, uh, into them. It gives a force which uh, will encourage them to create a rational peace. So the question is, can we create a rational peace? And what does that look like? So we get to the third part. What's the future of humanity look like? So today we've got all kinds of problems. We've got overpopulation, we've got energy shortages, we've got global warming, pollution, financial instability, species extinction, and terrorism. And um, at the same time, we have many thinkers who have envisioned um, positive, peaceful, cooperative societies. This is a book, uh, this is Thomas More's Utopia from the 1500s, and, uh, which he envisioned this island in which uh, people behaved cooperatively. Of course, he was scared to publish it because this was in a, a time when you know, they're hard to take that. Exactly, right. And so he wrote it in the special code and did all kinds of things to sort of try and distance himself from it. Um, if we look at all of those problems that uh, humanity faces, uh, most of them stem from the conflict between the individual and the group. Um, so, for example, there's the tragedy of the commons, which is, uh, we're seeing that right now in the case of fishing, uh, large fishes in the ocean. Uh, it's in each individual fisherman's interest to catch as many big fish as he can. I mean, he's depleting the supply of big fish, but the, his person, the amount he himself feels of that is very small, whereas the earth, whereas the world as a whole, is losing all the big fish. And so there's a, uh, an imbalance between the, the desires of the individual and the desires of the group. Uh, externalities like pollution. If you, you know, you can often do an industrial process more cheaply if you cause pollution, and it hurts you a little bit, but it hurts society as a whole much more. Uh, proliferation, population control, you know, we have the, the uh, Octomom, he has got 14 kids. And so, um, having kids is both a good thing and it potentially imposes a, a pressure on the world. Some people believe we're hitting the carrying capacity of the earth. How do we balance the desire of the individual to uh, replicate their genes as widely as possible with the needs of humanity as a whole? Equality, income disparity is a big issue. Damage due to competition, I mentioned the thing that the group wants cooperation whereas the individuals don't necessarily want to. Signaling costs. From the individual point of view, I might want to drive a super fancy car that you know, costs $300,000 to show how wonderful I am. It doesn't actually get me from point A to point B any better, um, but it creates a competition which forces other people to drive, drive fancy cars. And so society as a whole is devoting more of its resources to luxury goods which actually don't contribute to the society. So uh, I don't, I don't want to you know, uh, say fancy cars are so good, but there are a bunch of examples like that where resources get funneled to something which um, fr from the, the needs of the individual, which aren't necessarily uh, good for 